code. Yeah. All right. Good. So, as we often do, uh, we are going to be looking at uh, a couple of verses in this week's Torah reading. The section this week is called Shlach, which means it comes from the word meaning to send. When Moses sent the spies to spy out the land and they came back with a report that um, we can't do this. This is impossible, even though it's a divine mission, we can't do it. Okay. I don't want to go into all the verses, but there's some very, very interesting, uh, one particular set of verses that's very interesting, or one verse that's very interesting. And I um, already prepared it in English uh, for you. And let me just share screen and you'll be able to see it. Now, again, this was the statement, part of the statement to the spies when they went into the land of Israel, they came back and they were complaining that uh, the the people there are giants. We can't possibly overcome them. There's no way that we're going to be able to fight against them and so on and so forth. And this is part of what they said. And this is what I want to focus on tonight. It says, they say as follows. Now, again, there were 12 spies. 10 of them brought back this terrible report. And two of them contradicted. The two that contradicted, we'll discuss a little bit later, particularly one of them, Kalev, or Caleb, as some people call him, Kalev, who was actually the son of uh, Miriam, Moshe's um, sister. And um, the, uh, the other one was Joshua, Yeshua. We'll talk about that soon. But this is what they said. <clears throat> this is what the 10 spies said. There we saw the giants. The sons of the giant Anak, that was his name, of the Nephilim, those that fell. Nephilim means giants. I mean, that sounds translated usually, but Nephilim also means those who fell. And I'll explain what that means shortly. And here is the crux of the matter. And we were like grasshoppers in our own eyes. And so we appeared in their eyes. Again, we were like grasshoppers in our own eyes. And so we appeared in their eyes. Now, I'm going to get to the Kabbalistic um, interpretation of this shortly, but just be aware that there's often several dimensions in which Kabbalah an analyzes things. The one dimension is called, I think I mentioned this in last week's class or the week before, one is called the dimension of Hishtal Shalut how one thing develops from another. In other words, basically the cause, the world of cause and effect. So the original layer of Kabbalah based on the Zohar, but primarily in the teachings of Rabbi Moshe Cordovero, uh, 1500s uh, preceded the Arizal, actually uh, that towards the end of his life, the Arizal appeared on the scene, the Arizal, the great, master Kabbalist whose teachings we mostly follow these days. In any event, that would be called the Seder Hishtal Shalut, the cause and effect chain of events. And Kabbalah looks at that from the point of view primarily of the Sfirot. Right, so then there's another layer which is called, uh, instead not, not Hishtal Shalut, but called, it's called Hitlav Shut. It love should means the enclosement, literally. That's what it means, enclosing. What does it mean to enclose? It means when one force is clothed within another and one idea is clothed within another so that they form sort of some kind of symbiotic relationship. And finally, we have the, uh, the idea which is called hashra'a. Hashra'a means when we're talking about actual divinity itself, godliness itself. These could be paralleled, you could say, I guess, in, uh, in, in secular terms, you could call this the idea of anatomy, that would be hishtal shalut, in other words, this bone is connected to that bone, and so on, it's an anatomical, it's an anatomical analysis of things, and I have to be honest with you, um, in perusing many of the classes on Kabbalah in, uh, on the internet, uh, 
and many books as well that have been written, uh, for example, Sulam and various others, they basically try to reduce everything to anatomical issues. Yes, there's other things behind it, but that's their focus. Sort of the anatomy of uh, divine causation in the universe. You could put it that way, cause and effect, divine cause and effect in the universe. So it's anatomical. For most people, um, I would imagine anyway, for me, let, let me not talk about what other people think, but for me, I find that pretty bland. Um, I don't want to use different words. I find it bland and it's not, it's not all, it's not all that interesting. Once you know the structure of the anatomy, it's, you know, it's, it's basically a dry, it's dry bones, you know, it's a skeleton. Uh, it's, 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 it's not a living, it's not a living thing. When you get to physiology, however, Physiology is a living thing. Physiology is alive, right? Physiology is uh, is the idea of um, studying life systems and how they work together, right? That would be called physiology, studying life systems and how they work together. So there, that corresponds to the concept of hit, love, shoot, where one thing is in a symbiotic relation with another. In other words, one thing affects the other and they work together. And when they're working together, they form essentially a third thing. That's what's called in Kabbalah, the, the, the teaching about the Paratufim. The Paratufim, in other words, the, um, the Sfirot or clusters of Sfirot that enter into relationships. And that's what the focus of the Rizal was primarily on the idea of these Paratufim. I mentioned it a couple of weeks ago maybe last week as well. <clears throat> Finally, we get to what might be called psychology. It's more than psychology, but uh, it does focus definitely on the human psyche, on human psychology. But human psychology is a paradigm or a reflection rather, as a reflection of things that are happening in the divine sphere. Since man was created in the divine image, therefore by studying man, not just anatomically, not just physiologically, but psychologically, we can understand a lot of things that are going on in higher planes, in higher spheres. So what I wanted to do is examine this verse more from the psychological plane than any other. In other words, from the point of view of what would be called hashra'a, the dwelling upon the world of divinity or the revelation of godliness in the world. And what that means, essentially, uh, in terms of this verse and in terms of the spies. So, let me um, again just quote you the verse. There, the uh, the um, spies come back and they give a report about the land. They say, "Yes, it's a nice land, it's a good land, but the people that are living there are impossible to conquer." Basically, we saw the giants, the sons of the giants, the sons of giants of the Nephilim. And I'm going to explain what the feeling are. And we were like grasshoppers in our own eyes. And so we appeared in their eyes. And so we appeared in their eyes. So what is the idea over here that we are, uh, are talking about? So there's a number of different um, um, Hasidic commentaries in particular. Hasidic commentaries uh, generally look at things much more from the point of view of the psychology of a person, in other words, from the point of view of a shara, what revelation of godliness is it bringing into the world? They're looking at it from that point of view. So there's one um, uh, commentary called Atherit Yeshua, who says like this, he quotes from the Zohar. The Zohar says as follows, I'll just tell it to you in, uh, in, in Aramaic, and then I'll translate it for you. He says, man de'i hu ze'ir, Ihu Rav, someone who is small is someone who is great. Now, what does that mean? <laughs> what is he? What is he talking about? It would seem to be contradictory. Someone who's small is is, is actually great. So, he says like this: uh, someone who is small in his own eyes, he when he is small in his own eyes, he appears to be great in the eyes of others. But he says, don't misunderstand what that means. Don't misunderstand what that means. Someone who is small in his own eyes is only when he's looking at himself from the point of view of what he has achieved. 
of his ability to achieve, to change the world, to bring new things into the world, to reveal godliness in the world, when a person is always at the beginning, feels that he's always at the beginning of his journey, he's only just started, and there's so much more to do, and there's so much more that he's capable of, that is what's called a person who is small in his own eyes. At the same time, he says, however, if you are doing God's work, and that covers quite a uh, broad spectrum of things, but if you're doing God's work, then he quotes the verse, Vayigba libo badarke Hashem. That's a verse from uh, Chronicles. Chronicles, uh, Chronicles 2, uh, Chronicle, yeah, 2 Chronicles 17.6, if anyone's interested in uh, looking into it. 2 Chronicles 17.6. Okay, so so Divra Yomim base Yudzain Vav. Okay, so what does it say? Vayigba Libo Badarka Hashem. A person has to lift up his heart. In other words, be enthusiastic and be full of joy and full of energy when doing God's work. There you cannot look at yourself as uh, as 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 useless, as 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 being a, a washed up rag, as being um, uh, a sort of um, uh, you know. A, um, an individual who doesn't have any anything to offer or anything to um, anything to contribute it says that that is exactly the opposite of what you should be when it comes to your own achievements then you can say i'm only at the beginning of the, of the road i've just started even though you might have been doing this for 20 30 40 50 years right but i'm at the beginning there's so much more to achieve and the little that i've achieved there's plenty, plenty more to do, even if, even if a person achieves a lot, obviously. But when it comes to actually doing the work, when you're in the middle of doing the work and you're not reflecting on what you've accomplished, but you're doing the work, you're actually doing God's work, whatever it is, then you have to lift up your heart. You have to do it with enthusiasm and you have to do it with energy, boundless energy, in fact. And uh, only then will you be able to, uh, to achieve anything. Okay, that's at the time of uh, doing God's work, which could be, um, you know, going out and helping other people, whatever it might be. It's a time of, of when you're studying God's word, which is the Torah, essentially, the biblical and, and, and uh, rabbinic commentaries on it, and so on. And also when one is praying, then one's heart has to be enthusiastic and full of joy. Idu et Hashem b'simcha, serve God with joy. That's a basic principle in Hasidic uh, terminology. What was the problem with these spies? They went about things the opposite way. They said, nah, we're, we're just human beings. We can't like, well, it's not possible for us to, to fight against these giants. I mean, these are giants. These are feeling. These are the ones that fell. I'm going to explain what that means right now. How can we possibly fight against them? So there's another commentary that explains a little bit more. And he says like this. When we were in our own eyes as grasshoppers, that's what caused the problem. We looked at ourselves as if we are grasshoppers, as if we're nothing, as if we're useless, as if we have no power at all, as if we're just jumping around from one thing to another, and basically eating and uh, pooping all over the place, you know, once, you, once you're done with that. And we, we, don't, we don't achieve anything. Nothing, nothing have we done. Nothing are we, are we capable of achieving. We are simply grasshoppers. And then they looked at us and they said, we, uh, in, and we, were, we were grasshoppers in our own eyes. And therefore, therefore, we were grasshoppers in the eyes of others. Because we minimized our capacities and our, our, our abilities and our potential, and we thought of ourselves as washed up rags that can't do much, that's what caused the problem. That's what made it that we looked like grasshoppers in everybody else's eyes. They looked at us as if we were grasshoppers. Now, what brought them to this? How did they come to such a, a conclusion that they were grasshoppers in their own eyes? Because they saw says this, um, this uh, commentary. This commentary is actually from the, uh, the um, chief disciple of Rabbi Nachman of Breslev. His name is Rabbi Natan. And he wrote a, a work called Likute Halachot. 
Ikuta Halochas. And this is in Hilchas Nadorim, Halocha uh, Gimel, paragraph 17. This is what he says. When they saw the Nephilim, they saw these giants who had fallen. Where did they fall from? He said, these were, he brings the, uh, the um, uh, sages tell us, that these were giants that fell from heaven. These, there were, these were certain angels who fell from their status and they became physicalized. They became physical giants on earth rather than remaining in the heavens. Who were those giants? Those were the giants that complained at the time. They were angels at this time. But when the Jewish people were about to receive the Torah, they were about to receive the teachings, the blueprint, <clears throat> the blueprint of everything. Um, when they were about to receive it, these angels complained and they said, my enosh kitis karenu, who is man that you should think about him? They said to God, who man is like, they're, they're, what are they? They're, they're useless. They're, they're nothing. They're, they're finite beings. They're not nearly as capable as the angels. Give us your glory. Give, give your glory in the heavens. Give your, in other words, give your Torah to the angels. Don't give it to man. They're, they're going to be sinners. They're going to be people incapable of doing a lot. They're going to you know, live for 70 years, 80 years, 120 years and pass away. Like what use is that of giving them? Give it to the eternal angels. The angels are going to be around forever. And as a result, one of the, uh, their, their, their punishments, so to, speak, so to speak, was that they fell from their status and uh, they, became, um, they became physical giants down below. That, that's what the Jewish people saw. The problem was not that they saw them, they'd be spies. The problem was that they, that they swallowed their view of things. They saw the, they imbibed the idea that the angels had. Uh, descendants of the angels that came down to help the generation of Noah, these were Shamchazai and Azael, that's who they were. That, that's their names, their names are given in, uh, in the Torah, Shamchazai and Azael. Uh, did they come down and help in the time of Noah? No. Um, I don't know, I'll have to look into that, I'm not sure. I don't know if it was the same ones, I don't think so, but um, maybe. Good question. <clears throat> uh, we'll, we'll talk about how this relates to fear, fear, evil, inclination soon. The problem was, again, that they imbibed, these spies imbibed the angels' way of looking at them. Instead of looking at themselves as part of God above, in other words, instead of looking at themselves as full of divine potential, they saw themselves as compared with others compared with others who were once angelic beings and uh, were much more physically powerful and so on and so forth, not realizing that the soul is actually higher than the angels. They couldn't focus on that particular idea, or maybe they didn't understand that idea, that the, uh, the angels are on a lower level than souls. Where do the souls come from? The souls come from the world of Atzilut, which is the fourth world up. Right, souls stem from the, the inner dimension of the vessels of the world of Atzilut. There's lights and vessels in all of the worlds, and the lowest world is called Asiya, and then the next world up is called Yitzira, and then Bria, and then Atzilut. So the souls come from the world of Atzilut. The angels only come from the world of Bria, and those are the higher angels that come from the world of Bria. The permanent angels come from the world of Bria. The lower angels than that are in the worlds of Yitzira and Asiya. There's different categories of angels as well. I think we spoke about this last time or the time before, but uh, I don't want to go into it again. But that was the problem that they swallowed hook, line, and sinker the view that the angels had of them. These are inferior beings, and they, they, they absorbed that. So they thought of themselves as inferior. And because they felt that they were inferior, they said, we can't, we, we, we can't do it, even though they'd been given everything that they needed to be able to conquer the land, to be able to, uh, to do what had to be done. Uh, Aiden is asking, uh, how do the spies know that something the feeling felt about them? Uh, because they heard, you know, was this imbibing a transmission? Or did they get there because they saw themselves independently? They were told they were small and useless. Yeah, what happened was, if you remember the verse, the, the verse said, we were small in our eyes. 
right? And therefore we were small in their eyes. It says the, as the sages explain that they heard the angels, they heard these giants, these fallen angels, these giants talking and saying, we can see what looks like ants or, uh, or grasshoppers in the field. So they, that's what they heard from them. They understood, but how did that happen? That happened only because they first saw themselves as being inferior. Because they compared themselves with somebody else and didn't compare themselves with their infinite potential, therefore they felt themselves to be inferior. And that's exactly what happened they became, as a result, they became inferior. They couldn't possibly do what had to be done to the extent that they actually have to be, they had to, act to ha actually had to pass away in the desert. They were not, even though they, 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 um, they, they were repentant afterwards and they, but it was too late already. They'd already absorbed this slave mentality, this, this, uh, this victim mentality to such an extent that there was no hope for them. It had to be the next generation that carried out the conquest of uh, the conquest of the Holy Land. And we don't mean that just geographically. We mean it in a spiritual sense as well. So now we get back to a concept that uh, that that I mentioned in the um, um, in in um, I mentioned in the email. It's called a feedback loop. Now, what's a feedback loop? A feedback loop is a you get it in uh, electronics and you get it in computers and so on and so forth, but you also get it in, um, in, um, in psychology. A feedback loop is when a person has a certain image and he reinforces that image of himself, herself, constantly. Constantly looking for reinforcement of one's self-image instead of looking at oneself from the point of view of one's divine soul one looks at oneself from the point of view of how, how lowly and how weak and how, how much of a victim and how much of a, um, uh, a useless individual I am. And that perpetuates itself. That's what's called a feedback loop. Now there's the various ways of, um, the various aspects of feedback loops uh, where they, 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 they're different ones. They called um, the 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 the, the two loop, two feed, types of feedback loops. One is called a balancing feedback loop, and the other one is called a reinforcing feedback loop. Now, both of them could be positive, both of them could be negative. A positive um, balancing feedback loop is, for instance, an example that's given is you know when you need to eat when you're hungry, right? That's a feedback loop. In other words. When, you're, uh, when, when you feel your appetite returning, you want to eat something. So uh, that's a feedback loop. Then you go and eat and it's satisfied and so on and so forth. Another example that's usually given is um, when a person is, uh, let's say he's driving, right? And then there's a sign that, uh, that, that, that um, not that says what the speed limit is, but says what, you, what speed you're going at. And the funny thing is that when, uh, when people see these signs, you might see a speed, a speed limit sign of, let's say, 35, 40 miles an hour, whatever it may happen to be. It doesn't usually make you change your behavior. It doesn't make you slow down. But when you see what your own speed is and, the, and you know from prior to that what the speed limit is, then uh, they say about 70 to 80% of people, maybe even more, actually do slow down. That's also called a feedback, a balancing feedback loop. In other words, you get a message and you follow the message. Now, that's one kind of thing, and you can understand how a thermostat is another example of a feedback loop. When, uh, when, 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 when the heat is on, let's say, right? Uh, when the house gets warm enough, then it goes off. When the house cools down, then it goes up. Same with, uh, with, with, uh, with, with um, uh, cooling off the house with uh, air conditioning and so on and so forth. Those are feedback loops. So the problem is they could also be self-perpetuating. If a feedback loop is a psychological one, then one's always looking for confirmation of your psychological picture. And that's why some people cannot get, they cannot break out of their psychological um, uh, circle, their, their, their feedback loop. They can't break out of it or they don't break out of it. They could really, but they don't break out of it because it's sort of self-perpetuating. 
There's also reinforcing feedback loops, which reinforcing feedback, feedback loops uh, are ones that inculcate on the positive side, they inculcate positive habits, right? It increases the effect of a particular system or a particular process or whatever it may happen to be. And it's a way of achieving good habits. Also, unfortunately, it's a way of achieving bad habits. For instance, if a person smokes, let's say, right? He'll want to smoke again uh, in another 15, 20 minutes, half hour, hour, whatever, however addicted he is to, uh, to the cigarettes and uh, constantly uh, feels that, 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 that um, I'm lacking something, I'm missing something. And, and it can be a, um, a reinforcing feedback loop again to prevent the person from moving, uh, from moving forward. But it can also aid the person in moving forward by inculcating good habits. Now, let's just go back to our uh, situation with the spies over here. What was the problem with, uh, with the, the spies? Exactly that idea, we saw ourselves like this, and therefore everybody else saw us like that as well. In other words, it was a reinforcing loop, right? We saw ourselves as being, as being very small, as being grasshoppers, and therefore everyone else felt the same way. You know, when you meet a person, generally a person who's very lacking in self-confidence, People pick this up, whether they pick it up um, by, by physical cues or whether they pick it up by the way the person speaks about himself or, her or herself, or whether they just um, sort of get the vibe somehow from subconsciously um, that this person is regards themselves as a victim, then they start to treat the person as a victim. A very interesting um, uh, story about how I happened to be reading, uh, someone mentioned it to me. Uh, there was a certain um, young man who was, um, he was actually brilliant as a, uh, as a child, he was absolutely brilliant. He was the father of a rabbi, his name was Wolf Messing, you might have heard of him in terms of, from the point of view of hypnotism and, uh, and mind reading and, uh, and so on and so forth. So um, this was a boy that at the age of six, the age of six, had learned, uh, he, he knew half of the Talmud by heart at the age of six. <laughs> that's like, that's unbelievable. I mean, it's, he had unbelievable talents, but unfortunately, he wasn't particularly interested in them. And uh, he, um, he became a psychic and, uh, and all kinds of other uh, strange uh, things. He got into hypnotism. I mean, the stories that I told him are legendary kind of stories. He hid away on a train. He ran away from home and he hid on a train and the conductor came uh, asking for his ticket. And he just presented him with a blank piece of paper and the conductor clipped his piece of paper and, uh, and let him continue the journey. So he realized that he has certain powers of persuasion and so on and so forth. And the ability to read people's minds to a certain extent as well. There was an experiment that he did with Freud and Einstein at least that's how the legend goes. I don't know. Um, I mean, it's been reported that way. So I imagine that it's a true story that Freud and Einstein wanted to examine his capabilities of telepathy and understanding um, uh, mind reading and so on. So they got together in a room and um, Freud said, okay, I'm going to think of something. And uh, you go, uh, he said to this messing fellow, uh, Wolf Messing, you go and um, um, read my mind. Yeah, I'm going to read my mind. So uh, the uh, messing, uh, in fact, did that he walked out of the room and he came back with a tweezer <laughs> and he plucked out a hair or two from Einstein's mustache and gave it to Freud. And that's exactly what Freud had been thinking. The test was whether he'd be able to figure out what my what was going on in my mind. And that was exactly what went on in his mind. If you could have a couple <laughs> hairs from, <laughs> from Einstein's mustache interesting story but anyway um uh, i'm gonna get back i'll get back to all the questions shortly uh but yes that's exactly uh that's exactly the uh the um uh phraseology to use aiden it's self-sabotage right right comparing ourselves to to uh to to ourselves in a sense or comparing them to others who maybe achieve more than than we have is self-sabotage one has to compare oneself to one's potential and that gets to motivate you and move you more towards the, um, to where you should be. Now, 
I want to get onto the second part of, uh, of this idea, the more Kabbalistic aspect of it, which is how do you deal with it? How do you get past this idea? How do you get past this negative feedback loop? How do you break out of the self-destructive, um, self-sabotage, as Aiden calls it? How do you break out of the self-sabotage? And the answer uh, that is given is, in fact, in terms of um, Kalev, or Caleb, if you want to call him by the English name. What did Kalev do when they went into, uh, into the land? He understood where they were coming from and what they were about to do. So he went, it said that he went and he prostrated himself at the gravesite of Abraham, Abraham and Isaac, actually. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and he went to the Maharat he went to Hebron, to Hebron, to the Maharat HaMachpelah, to the burial cave of uh, the patriarchs, the cave of the patriarchs, and there he did what's called Hishtathut al Kivrei Tzadikim. He prostrated himself at the gravesite of these great saintly people, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and so on. And their wives, obviously. <clears throat> um, now, what is this concept of prostrating oneself there? What does that mean? So there's two explanations. I'm going to give the straightforward explanation from the Arizal, and I'll give the explanation from the Val Shem Tov. Okay. The idea from the, uh, from the Arizal is that um, when one goes and prostrates oneself at the gravesite of a great soul of a great soul any great soul but for sure the patriarchs and the matriarchs the vision that those people had of others of other people of their disciples of their families of their uh, their children their children's children in other words we who are descended from them that image gets absorbed into us. The image that they had of us as great people or people with great potential becomes absorbed in us to a certain extent. I'll say it a little bit more technically. There are several forms, uh, the Arizal explains, several forms of divine inspiration. We've spoken about this before. The, uh, the first Basic forms are as follows. Um, a person can have some kind of inspiration, divine inspiration in a dream. He can dream about, uh, about some subject that is actually prophetic to a certain extent. Now, one of the examples of this is, for instance, Pharaoh. Pharaoh dreamed that um, um, you know there were the seven fat cows and the seven thin cows and the seven stalks of wheat and so on and so forth. You know that dream. Uh, we don't have to go into it now, but that dream that he had and Joseph interpreted it for him and so on and so forth. Okay, that's dreams. Then there is a possibility of being taught an insight. A tremendous insight, but an insight by Elijah the prophet, by Eliyahu, Eliyahu Anovi, by Elijah the prophet. He can come and instruct a person in some facet of understanding, some facet of Torah, some facet usually of the secret teachings. In fact, if you have a look, one of the most famous sections of the Zohar, the introduction to the Tikkune Zohar, as it's called, um, it begins with the word Patach Eliyahu. Elijah opened his discourse. Eliyahu, Eliyahu is Eliyahu the prophet who went, he actually went, literally it says in the, in the verse that he went up to heaven with his body. He never died. And he became the teacher, the master of the secrets, or one of the masters of the secrets. And he teaches, uh, he was the one that taught. Um, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, the author of the Zohar, he was also one that visited often and taught the Arizal. Interestingly enough, Achia Hashiloni, who was another prophet, was the Baal Shem Tov's 
spiritual teacher. In any event, let's uh, let's uh, get to that uh, at some later stage. That's the um, the second level of um, of instruction, uh, the second level of of, of uh, divine inspiration, ruach hakodesh, as it's called. The third level is if a person is designated a certain spiritual teacher, an an angelic teacher who will teach him on a regular basis. The most famous one that we know about is Rabbi Joseph Cairo, the author of the Jewish Code, the Code of Jewish Law. Um, he would have meetings with his um, with his teacher, who was called the Magid Meshorim, the straight the straight shooter, the straightforward teacher. He taught everything straight, so to speak. He um, um, uh, he wrote a book, in fact, called Magid Meisharim, um, about his experiences with his teacher who taught him on a daily basis. Every day they would meet, uh, so to speak, and he would teach him. Okay, those are the first three. Then the fourth one is when the essence of a person's soul is revealed to him. And that is a very, very high level of, uh, of divine inspiration. It's the highest level which a person is capable of reaching on their own. This is the level that, in a sense, we're expected to reach, and this is the level that um, we are all capable of reaching to the root of our own souls. That's, in fact, what we're talking about over here uh, when we say that a, if a person lifts up his heart in the service of God, what does it mean he lifts himself up? He lifts up his heart. He lifts himself up to the root of his soul. He becomes down below what he is truly up above, right? So in other words, the root of his soul above becomes revealed to the person. Now, is this a possibility for everybody? It's possible for everybody, but not everybody achieves it. Uh, in fact, probably very few people achieve it. Okay, but there is a, an even higher level than that, and that's called Ibur Nishmat HaTzadik, the impregnation of the soul of a saintly person into your own soul to lead you higher than you are capable of achieving on your own. And that is exactly what Kalev went to do. Kalev went to um, prostrate himself at the graveside of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and their wives, Sarah and uh, Rivka and, um, and Leah. And um, he was able, therefore, to overcome the temptation to think in the same way as the spies. He thought completely differently. He was mishtateach, once he prostrated himself there, that lifted him up to a higher level than he was on previously. It lifted him up to be able to look at things the way the patriarchs looked at it. The patriarchs were given the land initially. Abraham was given the land. God said to him, this is the land that I have given you. And he tells him to go toward the, into the land and so on and so forth. And Abraham goes to the land and Abraham, Isaac, Jacob were all great lovers of the land of Israel. And so he went, when he went to, uh, to Hebron, to Hebron, and he prostrated himself there, he was imbued with that spiritual dimension from the, from the souls of the patriarchs and the matriarchs that lifted him up beyond the ordinary everyday world. And he was able to view things from their point of view, from the point of view of a great love for this holy land, for the holy land, essentially. <clears throat> the Baal Shem Tov explains it slightly differently. What, what does the Baal Shem Tov say? The Baal Shem Tov says as follows. He says that this whole concept of hishtathut, of uh, of Prostrating oneself at the graveside of a tzaddik doesn't necessarily mean only at the graveside of a tzaddik. It also means attaching yourself to the teachings of a saintly person, whether they're alive or whether they're no longer alive, it doesn't matter. But attaching yourself to such an extent that you begin to feel the presence of that person whose studies you are uh, delving into you begin to feel the presence of that person in your life. In other words, that it would be called Ibur Nishmata Tzadik, the impregnation of the soul of that 
holy person into your own soul to some extent, to a greater extent, to a lesser extent, whatever. But um, that enables the person to see things from a much loftier point of view than he was able to look at things by himself. And it doesn't only mean to prostrate yourself at the grave of a tzaddik to achieve this. It can be done from within the writings of that particular tzaddik, tzaddik meaning a saintly person, it can be done from within the writings of the tzaddik. Okay. I want to take this a step further and then I'm going to uh, answer the questions. <clears throat> the the Baal Shem Tov explains it as follows. He says like this, this, this there's um, the two uh, versions of it, but both basically they add up to the same thing. In the place where a person's thoughts are or in the place where a person's will is, that is where he, she is. In the place where a person's thoughts or will are, that is where the person is. In other words, if your thoughts are in smallness, if you're being small-minded, if you're thinking small, if you're thinking like a grasshopper, that is what you're going to be. You're going to be what you're thinking, what you're thinking about. If your thinking is the thinking of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, uh, Sarah, Rivka, Rebecca, and Leah, your thinking is going to be a completely different type of thinking, and your whole being will be in a different place. It's not going to be in the same place as you were before. There is um, uh, there are a number of different um, um, conclusions that one could draw from this, but basically the most important thing is you have to have your mindset fixed in such a way that you're thinking positive and thinking big and thinking in terms of your divine potential and not in terms of your actual achievements. Forget about your achievements. Forget about what you have done or you haven't done in the past. What one has to focus on is on your potential and how to manifest that potential in the world, in the world around you, in your own life, in your, uh, your daily activities and so on and so forth. And in that way, a person gets to be like Joshua and Caleb rather than like the uh, 10 spies. The 10 spies died in the desert. Caleb and Yeshua went into the Holy Land. In other words, they went into a place that was, well, they went into the promised land. Let's put it that way. And that's what's required. To prostrate yourself at the gravesite of a holy person. And uh, I, I do go to the gravesite of the Babaji Rebbe. In fact, I'm trying to um, arrange to go to the gravesite of the Balshem Tov in uh, the Ukraine at some point in time. Um, only that Russian tanks are massed on the borders of the Ukraine right now, so it's not. I've been to the gravesite of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai many times, uh, the Arizal, Rabbi Yitzhak Luria many times in Israel. Um, and um, but one can achieve the same things through cleaving to their teachings. Veikut, as it's called, Veikut to their teachings, is actually more powerful than simply going to the gravesite. Why is it more powerful? Because there they put themselves into their writings, into their teachings. Uh, when you go to the gravesite, yes, there's the spirit of the uh, tzaddik hovers over the grave, but it's not probably not the same level as absorbing their teachings um, fully into one's own psyche and one's own consciousness and so on. All right. Uh, let me look at some of the questions, and I'm sorry, I'm sorry I didn't answer them before. There are many of them. Uh, let's see. Uh, okay, so it relates to fear, fear and the evil inclination. What's fear and the evil inclination? Fear is fear of what are people going to say? What am I, what's going to happen if I fail? What's going to happen if, etc. The evil inclination is the inclination to do much less than I'm capable of doing. It's to dumb things down 
and to regard myself as a victim and to um, therefore not achieve anything, really not achieve anything as a feedback loop that, well, I'm not capable of achieving anything and I'll prove it to you and therefore not doing anything. Um, okay, I answered that question from Aiden. Uh, physically, physically or spiritual small in relationship to the Nephilim. They were physically small in relationship to the Nephilim, but spiritually they were greater than the Nephilim. The soul is greater than the angels. The soul, the root of the soul is greater than the angels. And therefore the potential that one has, after all, the, the soul is from the world of Atzilut and it's called part of God above. And uh, that's much greater than the angels are only in the world of Bria. There's an exponential gap between Bria and Atzilut. Uh, yeah, it is self-sabotage, that is correct. Um, could you say the spies fell into the mire of Asiya and forgot they were actually in Shoma from Atzilus, like most of us here, like us? Yes, uh, that, that would certainly be one way of uh, putting it. Uh, yes, not only did they fall into the world of Asiya, but they fell into like the mud of the world of Asiya, so to speak. Um, in other words, um, they fell down pretty low, and uh, unfortunately, right. Um, our form is significant, but nowhere near as meaningful as our function. Yet our function is meaningful, but nowhere near as significant as our purpose. Yes, I can't always breathe easily, but if I focus that, I, that on that, I lose the potential meaning on my function and why I'm here. It's all at well. I mean, holy purpose remains hidden. Sorry, this is somewhat unclear. No, it's not unclear at all. It's very clear. You actually said it very, very nicely. Um, there's form and there's function and there's purpose. And purpose transcends everything. If we're able to fulfill our purpose, which is really what the will is all about, that's what the Baal Shem Tov meant. When a person's will is in the right place, in other words, in the purpose for which you were sent down to this earth, then the doors are open. The gates are open. Uh, someone just sent me a, um, uh, a good friend of mine uh sent me a um uh, a, uh an account of an incident that happened to him he was supposed to meet a certain rabbi in uh jerusalem uh to go to his synagogue in jerusalem they were supposed to meet inside the synagogue and he arrived early he couldn't sleep so he arrived early and he was going to go and sit and study in that synagogue but when he went he found the gate locked right and he said it was so ironic because the uh, above the gate there was uh, this big sign that said this is the gateway to God. You know, that's a verse from uh, from what Jacob's so Jacob's vision. Jacob said, right? This is the um, this is the gate of heaven. And um, and so he's sitting outside the gate, really, really frustrated, and he can't get in. And uh, and uh, 45 minutes it takes for the rabbi. The rabbi arrived on time, but he was early. And, uh, he, you know, the rabbi noticed he was very, like, restless and, 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 and a little bit um, annoyed that he'd been waiting around. He couldn't get into the shul, into the synagogue, and the uh, rabbi showed him. <laughs> you could have gotten in easily. There's actually no lock on the gate. It just looks like it's locked, but it's not. You could just open the gate and walk in. And he said that that is, in fact, very, um, uh, for him, it was a very deep, lesson the gates look like they locked but they're really open all you have to do is push them open and you're good right that's the um that's the idea is this the very much the breslov approach to Rebbe Nachman? yes it is the breslov approach it is the hasidic hasidic approach altogether it's the hasidic approach that's the uh that's that's the way hasidim look at things they look at things not in in from the point of view of the negative, what have I done wrong? What do I need to correct? What is my uh, weak point? What are my weak points? Where have I, you know, sinned? Let's, you know, that kind of, we don't look at it that way. Yes, it's important. There's certain times when this and that, and that, that is appropriate, even certain times of the day when that's appropriate. When you get to the end of the day, you look over the day and see what, what could I have done better, right? When you get to the end of the day before you go to sleep, but then you cancel it out. You say, you do what's called, you say, you say, and you're done right then you start off the next day but the next day is the day of potential full of potential you wake up in the morning i mean i know people that like jump out of bed people older than me that jump out of uh jump out of bed in the morning at the crack of dawn and they rear into go the whole day um and uh, that's really the way it should be 
that is really the way it should be. Uh, when a person is living within their purpose, living within their will and their thought, and their thought and the will are focused on the right thing, you know, there's no lying in bed and uh, and uh, and depression and sadness and lethargy and uh, and so on and so forth. Yes, people get tired, even people who are very energetic and very focused and very purpose driven get tired. Everybody gets tired, but once you've had a rest, you're up and ready to go. Okay. Uh, yeah, it has one objectively aware when uh, when one is being taught by a high level source. Can a simple person qualify to be taught by a high level source? So you made a made an Eldad, Eldad and Maidad, yes. Um, yes. Who were um, uh, made an Eldad? These were when, uh, when uh, it was actually last week, last week's Parsha, last week's Torah reading, um, Moses chooses um, 70 elders. But there were actually, he chose six from each tribe, six, 12, 72, right? There were 72, uh, because that was just a fair way of doing it, uh, six from each tribe. But since the, um, um, the instruction that he received was that it should be 70, which is the number of the Sanhedrin, the great rabbinical court, was 70 rabbis, 70 elders, 70 uh, um, um, scholars <clears throat> so um there were 72 who were cho who were who, who were potentially chosen they just had to pick out a you know um uh how do you call it a note out of a hat yeah you are chosen and there, there were two that were not chosen but nevertheless they received divine prophecy so um they received divine prophecy and um their names were Medad and Eldad and uh they were actually, interestingly enough, they prophesied that Moses will pass on, he will pass away, and Joshua will take the Jewish people, the Israelites, into, into the land of Israel, into the Holy Land. And that, that was, in fact, true. And as soon as Joshua heard what they were saying, he, he ran to Moses and he said to him, Adrini Moshe Kalaim, yeah, lock them up or um, destroy them. So Moses said, what are you worried for me? I'll, um, if, only, if only all of my people will become prophets, if only all of them will become prophets. So you could ask the question, well, what happened with, with Korach? Korach also um, said that uh, someone else should be the leader instead of Moses. He tried to depose Moshe, tried to depose him. What's the difference? The difference was that Korach was political. Here, they were just prophets. They received divine inspiration, prophecy, and uh, they were saying what was true. And Moses says, uh, you know, uh, on the contrary, uh, if, I, if everyone was like that, my job would be pretty easy uh, in, any, in any event. Okay, yeah, that's the, uh, that's the story of Eldad and Maidad. So um, um, they can be taught by a high-level source. These men received prophecy, all 70, all 72 of them actually receive prophecy from above. So it is definitely possible for a person of, um, um, look, uh, the, the classic example actually is Samson, Shimshon. Samson was born, born to very, very, his father Manoach and his mother were very, very simple people. And Samson, Shimshon was endowed with uh, unbelievable power and leadership and he was divinely inspired. And uh, so, yes, it can happen to, to anybody. Only what the, um, uh, the Baal Shem Tov explains that you, ha you have to do your, don't just wait for God to do everything. You have to do your part. You know, you have to improve yourself. You have to uh, get, the, uh, get, get the vessel clean. In other words, you have to um, do what's necessary to, to do your part. You know, you're not going to be given these things unless you're a clean vessel. And um, so that's what you have to do. Okay, let's see a little bit further. Um, well, out of the self-sabotage become entangled with the teachings of masters, exactly. So you become the channel for the transmission of high purpose. Boy, you said, well, uh, by the way, your name, Aiden, um, I don't know if that's how you pronounce it, but the name Aiden is actually Eden. Eden meaning the Garden of Eden, and that's where it comes from. It's pronounced in Hebrew, it's pronounced Aiden, Gan Aiden, it's not pronounced Eden, Aiden. So interesting name. 
um channel for the transmission of higher purpose you said it very well by aligning your thinking spiritual presence with the highest purpose it makes you see your full divine potential and makes it to the holy land in whatever way that could be interpreted and not become lost in the desert of despair boy you write well the master is both a teacher and the way and if they can't be the physically to teach you their writings the next best bet i'm going to copy and paste that into <laughs> into a document i like it so much I hope you don't mind that I'm going to use it uh, at some point in time. That is great. Beautiful. Uh, actually, let me see here. I'll put it at the end of this document here. Sorry, one second, folks. That is just so well said. That's exactly right. Um, okay. So uh, Ben says, as Jews, we must remember the Holy Spirit of powerful guides and helpers. But between the Jews and Hashem, there are no intermediaries. Yes, yes, yes. The, the, yeah, it's a very good thing you pointed out, Ben. Thank you. Uh, I really appreciate that because don't make the mistake that we pray to the tzaddik. We don't, right? The tzaddik is a guide and we try and emulate his or her um, relationship with God in our own particular way because you can never be somebody else, but they give you the guidance as to how to do it. Not who to be, but how to be what you can be. That's the that's the point. Excellent. I'm I'm very glad that you uh, that you pointed that out. Uh, you're very welcome, Terry. Um, <laughs> I was the cause of it, so it's mine. All right. Thank you. <laughs> All right, uh, folks. We are going to. I'll just say again, um, if you don't mind, um, try and if you don't mind, uh, get hold of uh, of Ellen at uh, Florini at Ellensoft.com over here um if anybody is interested in putting a little bit of time um in tagging and so on and so forth on youtube uh so that we can make a proper catalog of the classes uh so they things are easier to find okay folks um one new message let me just see what that is shabbat shalom from colombia yeah shabbat shalom to everybody have a wonderful uh shabbat a wonderful weekend it begins the new month next week the new month is actually on Thursday, uh, the new Hebrew month, the month of Tammuz, next Thursday. So we will um, mention that in class, hopefully next week. Okay, good night and um, all the best. Have a great week. Shalom.